uh, over the air broadcast TV. Yeah. And the station isn't yet on cable TV. The people who are watching aren't necessarily people who are going to be on Twitter. Right, right, right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, entirely different audience. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a completely different audience, and I'm really happy to be bringing them science. Yeah. And the the network's working to get us on cable. Um, it also goes out on the internet and on Roku and Box TV. Right. Um, but those are the same people that are already watching us. So. Yeah, yeah, just using a different a different way that they're going about it. But it's cool because they're however you get ratings nowadays, I have no idea. Um, they have an estimated audience of 450,000. So right. we're going out to a lot of people who just probably aren't on Twitter. <laughs> right, in theory. Um, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to Astronomy Cast. For those of you wondering is that you have stumbled into, uh, I'm Fraser, that's Pamela. We're going to record a live episode of Astronomy Cast. And you're going to watch. Uh, I'm going to say hi to Andrew Planet, Bri Astro, Chad Weber, TPI 209, George Kialis, Guido Bibra, Ian Farquhar, Jamie S., John Suffield, Johnny Z., Larry King, Linda Sadiq, Miguel Angel Romero, Mrs. Nat, Mr. X, Mr. Y, Nancy Graziano, Nicholas B. Wow, there's a bunch of people. Paul Disney, Paul Gracie, Rich Wilson, Arjon, Roger Haskins, Sir Goosey, Simos, Tesla Ranger, Trey Harmon, Zach P Perry, Zafan Zafan. Uh, and we've got uh, Aman Derps, Gordon Dewis, Beatrix Lidner, Lillian Brennan, Larry King. I think we got everybody. Carl Holt, Ben Kalo, Hug Birkog, John Suffield. Yeah, it's a big crowd today. Why? That's exciting. What did we do? We existed. <laughs> yeah. People like the All fact we that did we was exist. just did 595 episodes, 594. Yes, and and I can say hi to Bad Panda, Zine, DPI 209, Broken Symmetry, Jessica Wolf, Veronica Cure, Planetary Pan, and those are the people who've said hi over on Twitch. They're still learning to stay hi. Yeah, that's the trick. Uh, Hal McKinney, hey. Katrina Astro YYZ, Andrew Planet, Mrs. Nat, Sabri Lark. All right. Uh, cool. What's happening? It's cold. Really? It's oh, it's so cold it's, here. It's nice. It's great here. Yeah, I'd like so, no coat, no gloves. Finally, yesterday it was super muddy and gross, and I had the dogs locked in most of the day, which they did not appreciate. And this morning I was like, "There's no way it's dry yet." Well, it's not dry. It's frozen, so the dog door is unlocked. <laughs> the ground just. Froze. <laughs> um yeah i got no news i i okay. mean there's nothing to talk That's, about that is completely all yeah. right yeah um i guess starship exploded <laughs> again that was spectacular yeah, watch that happen uh and and this is the one that fell over like yes. in High Bay, it fell over. It did fall over, yes. It damaged one of its wings, and mm -hmm. they weren't sure if there was internal damage from the components absorbing energy during the mm -hmm. Um, So the fact that it worked and they flew it? Yeah. We don't normally fly things we drop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it... Uh... But the and it is interesting though. You could see Elon Musk. He made a mea culpa on Twitter. He said it probably would have been a better idea to start all three engines and then turn off the engines. That that when we had too many engines, yes. as opposed to turning on all three engines or turning on only two engines and then one of them not working. So, lesson yeah. learned for next time. Um, the the sort of that suicide flip at the very end there, it just seems like madness. I mean, you think it you feels won't... like they should be doing it at a higher altitude and I know why they don't. But... Yeah. I think it's because they, because they don't have enough fuel in that, in that top tank to be able to, to supply the engines enough to slow it down. Yeah. 
And there's a very different terminal velocity for it. Yeah. Falling like a log and falling like a lawn dart. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely. essentially a lawn dart. So, so it is, uh, yeah, it is definitely a, a, a challenge. And again, like just imagine, like imagine you're on that thing, like you're taking your, your intercontinental flight and you take off and you rise to a ballistic altitude, you know, ballistic trajectory. You're pretty much free falling through space as you go. And mm -hmm. then you fall through the atmosphere, turn sideways, uh, tumble with the wind buffeting as it's falling and you, like yes. you've been you're strapped into your seats so you're probably i don't know which way you're facing now like i'm assuming you're like lying on your back to take off and yeah, then so and then i'm gonna guess it's gonna roll so at least you're lying on your like you're facing up but you're gonna be you're gonna have no gravity yeah and then it's gonna have to turn again and belly flop and then it's gonna have to pop at the last minute and go so you're not sure you're seeing the ground like coming right at you and then it's gonna hope it turns and works well at least you can't actually see the ground from the way it's oriented but it it does make one think about a lot of the roller coaster rides that are out there that have you go straight up yeah. and then straight down that's essentially the kind of thing that you're going to experience. Yeah, except a little, like, longer for... Yes, although I would pay good money for a roller coaster ride that lasted that long. And I, I'm kind of hoping that sometime in my life we're paying good money to, like, hop over to Japan using that kind of technology. Because not having to fly for close to 20 hours, I, I'm a fan of that. Really? Idea. You would take a a ballistic trajectory to japan yes with a flip at the end yes <sighs> no way if they had it proven as well as they have the falcon nines proven yeah i'm down for that oh wait one of my early no memories way. is is living in boston and as we were on the way to the airport probably to fly to my grandparents or something there were flatbed trucks with pieces of an airplane that had crashed into Boston Harbor coming out. Mm -hmm. And I still got on an airplane. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to lie. Every time I land at LaGuardia or, or Boston Logan in the winter and I'm coming in over the water, I'm pretty sure I'm going to die. But I never do. No, no, no. And no, I mean, you're... You Airplanes are safe. You're more likely, I mean, it's, it is always a little nerve wracking to just consider the fact that you are very high. Um, but, but you know that the safety record is very safe. So that's the key is the, is the, is the safety record. Chad and says I'm Fraser also I... likes the safety of horses versus cars. No way. I don't like horses. I don't like them at all. I'm a horse. I know. Rider. I don't like them one bit. I don't want, I don't want my, I don't want my, my mode of transportation to have a mind of its own it's not and to occasionally be afraid of butterflies yeah yeah exactly they're like great big scaredy cats um okay anyway let's let's get on with the show <laughs> all right let me know all when right. you're ready um i i'm pressing all the records it is recording. Hello, Ali. Hello, Rich. Hello, all the humans that make our show go. I am also recording. Uh, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 595, Planet Hunting, Revisited. Re-revisited? Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I'm I'm doing cold. I I'm out here in the American Midwest at that southern edge of this great cold blight that followed in all of the snow, but. It's February, and this means that the crocuses are starting up. Mm -hmm. And when the f when the ground thaws, it shall be muddy season, followed by gardening. How yeah. about you? Uh, yeah, same. Well, I, here it's 
way better. Uh, it's finally sort of turning the corner. We're coming into our spring, I think. It's still, I mean, February can be hit or miss, but I'm now able to go for walks with just a couple of layers and not like my big warm coat. I'm in Canada, so, you know. Yeah. So we we all have big warm coats. Um, I don't have to wear gloves. It's good. But yeah, exactly. Same thing. I'm seeing the crocuses come up. I know I put a zillion tulips and daffodils into the into the garden, and so I'm looking forward to to that all uh, all popping up in just like a few weeks now so i'm pretty i'm pretty excited about that actually this is gonna be another one of those evergreen topics where we come back again and again finding planets every time we talk about this now it seems like we've gained thousands of new planets well buckle up new techniques will grow that by tens of thousands and even millions and we'll talk about that in a second but first let's have a break Okay, and we're back. How many planets are there? I haven't even checked today's number. I, I, I know that it will change between when we record, yes. when it is edited, and when it gets published. There are thousands of known exoplanets. Pa we're going to go with thousands and just <laughs> yeah. stop there. Yeah, well, possibly new planets will have been announced during the show. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's gotten to the point that I don't know about you, but... I see a new paper announcing that it has found like 40 new planets. I'm like, nah, yeah, it's a yeah. day ending and why? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Eh, that's a lot. But, you know, okay, we're at 4,341 confirmed exoplanets, 5,742 candidate planets, and 3,216 of which are planetary systems. And this is as of 2.14 p.m. Right. GMT yeah. minus six. Yeah, mark the on time. On February fifth. <laughs> yeah, mark the time because because it is going to change. Um, but so you know, obviously, we've talked about planet hunting, various techniques and stuff. But but let's give people a quick overview, and and then we'll sort of move into I think a lot of the exciting new developments, the new spacecraft that have come up, and some of the new techniques that will take us to the next level. So so how do we find planets right now? So there's three main techniques. The The first one, which was actually the first way that we found exoplanets around regular stars, is when you look at a star and you spread its light out into a rainbow, there's a bunch of bright and dark patterns in that rainbow of light. And those correspond to the emission and absorption lines of different atoms, and they have very precise wavelengths they occur at. But if that star is moving, that's going to cause the colors of those lines to shift to the red and the blue, depending on if the star's getting blue shifted towards you or red shifted away. Well, it turns out that the gravity of a planet going around and around that star will move the star ever so slightly at the same rate that a human being can walk. Right. Well, walking speed. You could outrun, you could outwalk the uh, the speed that the star is being moved by the planet but it's but enough we can measure that just like the police out there measuring your car by how it shifts the radio or the radar or the laser light bounced off of it we can measure the speeds of stars spectroscopically so that that is the the og way of finding planets around regular stars now Beyond that, we can also look for the planet directly passing between us and the star, where as that planet goes in front of the star from our perspective, it will block out the smallest portion of light. And this doesn't require a huge telescope to detect. It requires an extremely accurate and precise telescope to, to detect. And so now we have folks with beautifully set up equipment peering at segments of the sky from the ground and from space, looking at hundreds of stars at once in some cases, tens of thousands of stars at once in other cases, looking for these faint little dips caused by planets. And, and I think that's the direction that all of this is going. And it's a very similar direction that all science seems to go is you start out by just testing out a new idea. Can we detect the light being dimmed as a planet passes in front of its star? Okay, great. 
Can we do that for an entire region of sky simultaneously? Turns out, yes. That was Kepler, that's Tess, and, and it's a very powerful technique. And, and the other technique, which in many ways is absolutely shocking with what it finds, is we, we've talked about gravitational lensing on this show before, which is where you have some sort of a mass pass in front of a background object, and this mass's gravity is able to direct more light at us than we would normally see. Essentially, that background object suddenly gets brighter if you're dealing with a moving system. And there's been cases where we've seen a star and then additional blips of, of gravitational lensing that is caused by a planet. There, there was a case of a moon. And, and it looks like, and we'll talk more about this in a few minutes, um, there, there has been dozens of Jupiter mass objects found just hanging out by their lonesome, wandering our galaxy right. without a star. And, and so with this technique, the gravitational microlensing, the, the upside is that you can detect the planets very, sen you know, with great sensitivity, you can detect very small planets, even potentially moons. The downside is you only get one shot at it. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I think that sets the stage for the main methods that we have for detecting planets today. And then I think we're going to talk about the new techniques that we have sort of improvements on those methods, but then also some of the new techniques that are that are coming out, they're going to take us, as I said, into the 10s of 1000s, potentially even millions of planets. So we'll talk about we'll talk about that in a second. But first, let's have a break. And we're back. All right, so we've set the scene, we've got the radial velocity method, the gravity yanking the, the star back and forth from the planet. We've got the transit method where the planet passes in front of the star, dims it a little bit. We've got the gravitational microlensing where the foreground star acts like a lens to a background object and and you can detect the planet in the in the foreground star. Crazy techniques. So first I'd like to talk about how astronomers are pushing these techniques that already work to the next level because there's a bunch of new missions that have come out recently and are just about to launch. So let's talk about that first. So it it's not just the spacecraft. I had I have to say True. that yeah, yeah. ground no, based right. stuff is is amazing. And I I think what the very large telescope with their sphere instrument is doing is to me in some ways the most exciting. They have the capacity with these giant telescopes they're using down in Chile to actually image directly planets going around stars. Now, this this isn't currently how we find them. This is how we follow up on them most of the time. There's accidental discoveries made of planets periodically. But with Sphere, there's the ability to see the planet all by its lonesome because the images are that high a resolution. There is the ability to see them due to the, the gravitational effects, the Doppler shifting of the spectra, and to combine all of this data, including polarimetry data, to get a sense of, of how it all fits together, how everything's aligned and moving within the system. So, I mean, you kind of jumped the gun there, um, which is that, that I was, I, you know, that's an entirely new technique, the direct imaging, and we, there's astrometry as well. Um, but I mean, there are, as you said, there are ground based, there's some ground based missions that are doing really sensitive radio velocity work. Some there's a, um, you know, there's a ground based with, the, oh, is it with the University of Arizona? Oh, it's a, isn't it at your old stomping ground up on on the McDonald's? Observatory. So McDonald Observatory is the University of Texas, and they are using the Hubble Eberly Telescope yeah, to look right. for planets. That's right, and they have a, a powerful new radio velocity system that can detect down to potentially Earth-sized worlds. And this is another one of the cool directions that's being gone in. Is we have the Hubble Eberly, we have the HARPS instrument on the three point five meter uh, Lassell Observatory. I. Uh, there's the Anglo-Australian Planet Search. Uh, that's on a 3.9 meter Anglo-Australian telescope. And these various systems are looking at stars for year after year after year, which is something you can't do with a space telescope that doesn't last as many years. 
And and with systems like the Anglo-Australian Telescope that started its search in 2000, they're trying to find the, the changes in motion of a star that indicate there's a Jupiter mass object at a Jupiter-like right. distance. And it's the ability to detect things on many, many year orbits where we really want to see the completion of three orbits before we actually believe something is there. Mm -hmm. This is the next big thing that's going to begin to happen because finally enough years have gone by since we detected planets to have enough data to find this new kind of planet. Right. And and so you've got these, these again, those ground-based observatories. There's also like new, uh, there's KEOPS, for example, which is a European yes. Space Agency mission, which recently just released a whole bunch of data about six planets in resonance around a star. It had been discovered by TESS, and then KEOPS went and just analyzed the entire system to the nth degree, which is just fantastic. And we're starting to get better statistics because we have so many more instruments. Gaia is another one that is a quiet planet finder working in the background as it surveys star after star after star after star, periodically picking up on those dips that indicate a transit. And in the process is helping us understand what is the population of planets out there. And it's turning out that you pretty much, if you are a star, you have a planet it's it's kind of looking that way mm -hmm. as long as you have the components so there are stars out there that are like hydrogen helium not much else and the environment that they were created in didn't have much else and planets are made of heavier things than hydrogen and helium so to get planets you do need to have more material around so our sun for instance when you look at its light you you start to see iron technetium carbon oxygen all these heavier elements in its atmosphere are reflective of the heavier elements that went into making our planets right and then we've got telescopes like uh, nancy grace roman which is going to take micro lenses can do to, I guess, transit to micro lensing. What Kepler did for transiting, Nancy Grace Roman is going to do for micro lensing. And, and this is extremely exciting because we're so far with the micro lensing technique at the tens of planets, more like 10 ish planets that have been found this way. And, and there's multiple groups. There's, there's the Ogle group that's been doing this. There's MOA, which is micro lending observations in astrophysics. There's the planet survey, which is probing lensing anomalies network. And these systems are pointed either at the wealth of stars in the center of our galaxy or out towards the nearby Magellanic clouds. And they see the transits and then they wait in hopes that as the two objects separate, we'll be able to look at the object that has the planets that were observed with the transit. You can only see so much from the Earth. Nancy Grace Roman from space, this is the mission formerly called W first, is going to be able to follow up on many more stars without the complexities of an atmosphere to contend with and hopefully rapidly increase the number that are found this way. All right, we're going to go a little more into uh, some of these other techniques as well as the, the one that you already started to talk a bit about, which is the direct imaging, which is incredibly exciting. Uh, but we'll talk about that after the break. And we're back. So Nancy Grace Roman gets us probably thousands of planets using micro lensing Gaia, which you mentioned, which is using the astrometry method, uh, where you're seeing the star, it's like you're seeing the radio velocity, but now you're seeing it from the face on. It you're also picks up on on transits, it's just harder to explain astrometry. So I'll try. Yeah. So so the transiting method catches the planets that pass in front of a star and dim the light because planets aren't as bright. So you put them in front, 
But the amount that it dims the light is kind of like a moth in front of one of those giant spotlights they put out for movie premieres that you see up in the sky. That moth can only block so much light. That difference in the total output is hard to see, but it's possible. Now, at the same time, if you have a star and you have a planet going around it in the plane of the sky, we may not be able to see that planet directly, but as it goes around, it will actually ever so slightly cause the star to move in the sky relative to all the stars around it. Right. And so like if you saw all the stars, they would be just like making these tiny little circles in the sky. And the more planets you put around a star, the more complex it is to see these kinds of motions. The bigger the star, the less of an effect you're going to see. So techniques like this are really good at finding small stars with a couple of massive planets or just one massive planet because that tug of war is easy to see in the sky. Right. Um, and I mean, I think so far, we've only had a couple of big updates from the European Space Agency's Gaia mission, mostly focused on stars, but the instrument it has been gathering data on planets potentially, or I guess the stars moving thanks to planets. And I, I think we will see eventually 10s of 1000s of planets pour out of Gaia just as a as a side effect of this incredible mission. And and this is another one where every extra year the mission is in space, every extra year it's gathering data, the more likely we are to see these events. In, in order to say that we definitely saw an object, we ideally want to see three at least events so that we have the time separation from event A to B, the separation from B to C, that starts to hint that there is something there. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to that, you want to either confirm it via another method or just keep watching until you've seen so many events that you can no longer deny that it's there. And with Gaia, it's going to be finding things that we aren't going to see any other way necessarily. If, if a planet is going around in the plane of the sky, we're not going to see the Doppler shifting in the spectra. We're not going to see the eclipse of a transit. So it's going to have to be the year after year after year catching multiple orbits that allows us to finally say, yes, there's a planet here. And while the, the you know, the transit me method and the radio velocity method, they only let you see about like 1% of the planets that are out there, they have to be perfectly lined up. The in theory, astrometry will show them all. It's just the level of sensitivity that you need to, you know, there's going to be, you're, there are going to be limits, but it, but it doesn't matter the angle. And then, so let's move on to the direct imaging method. You talked about the sphere instrument. This is really just a prototype. What's happening on sphere is a test run of the real machine, which is coming with the extremely large telescope. And and even before then, they're going to be updating Sphere to the Zimbal Cheops uh, upgrade. And, and the idea is with these massive systems that have the ability to flex the mirror in reaction to what's going on in the sky so that you can essentially erase the atmospheric effects. With, with these instruments, you, you precisely focus and you put some sort of, of a blocking plate in front of the star so that its light isn't getting to your detector, isn't reflecting around in your instrument. And with the star blocked out in this extremely precise system, you can see the little planet off by its lonesome doing its planetary thing. And this is kind of amazing. And this is getting done, especially in combination with radio and infrared observations in young planetary systems, allowing us to make out these hot planets still forming in the eddies of dusty systems that appear in Alma. It's, it's starting to become many telescopes working together to try and see how it is solar systems form by looking at the ways all the materials mix 
And each new discovery teaches us we really have no idea what's going on, which is exciting and awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's the best. I, with the sphere, they also have an, a, a machine attached to the the very large telescope called Espresso. And, yes. and its job, like I just want to sort of show the level of detail here. So its job is to detect the polarization of the light passing through the atmosphere of an exoplanet. And so essentially the light bounces off the star gets polarized by the the atmosphere and it creates this signal that this espresso instrument attached to the very large telescope using sphere as a to, as a coronagraph can detect and suddenly the star disappears and you've got these little planets orbiting around it just absolutely stunning but but the next generation of the telescopes the big ones the 30 meter telescope the magellan telescope the 39 meter extremely large telescope this will be the era of directly observing planets with badly named telescopes with badly named <laughs> no way i love the extremely <laughs> large telescope it's just it's just right on the nose i like it so, so we used to have telescopes like the mail the lick uh, Lick, yeah. Mount Wilson, and and now it's like very large telescope, extremely large telescope, overwhelmingly oh large telescope. Yeah, there is an X. We've talked about this. There is an XKCD cartoon that goes into this and makes fun of this idea. What will let's? I just want to go right to the big one. Let's the extremely yeah. large telescope. What will we be able to see in the extremely large telescope? If it works as everyone hopes, we will start to be able to see earth-like planets around sun-like stars and currently we can't see earth-like planets around stars that big and it would be exciting to find our siblings out there among the stars yeah so we will be looking at other earth-sized we will be looking at other sun-like stars we will be observing the atmospheres of the planets that are going around them looking for those biosignatures looking for those signs of life um, it's interesting. I did a, I read a paper um, about a year ago or so where they were estimating if you just like run the curve of how many planets and how quickly that we're finding them, it's this growth curve. And if you just continue on this exponential path, by 2050, we'll probably know of about 30 to 50 million planets. And, and one of the things that broke me is as I was reading about the results of free floating, no star in sight, Jupiter sized planets that are getting found with gravitational lenses. They estimate there are as many between the stars as around the stars. Yes. I I've and even heard like maybe many, many more. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. A 10 times as many as there are stars. Like, it totally changes our understanding of what the galaxy is made up of. So, so there are probably more free-forming planets, not free-forming, free-floating planets. We don't know how they formed. Anyone yeah. tells you they know how a planet formed, they're lying. Yeah. Um, there are probably as many free-floating planets as there are planets around stars of this type. And there's more planets than stars because stars tend to gather up many at a time. It's it's mind blowing. Again, it's yes. mind blowing to think that that in our lifetimes we didn't know of any planets, and now we know of thousands of planets, and we will eventually know of millions of planets. Just absolutely fascinating. Uh, that we're both bored and excited. <laughs> you know, don't show up unless you've got a thousand new planets to tell me about. Absolutely. Or something weird. Do you have a favorite planet? I have a favorite planet. Uh. Earth. <laughs> so, so for me, it's it's Kelt 9b. It's it's a planet that was found by a team with Scott Gowdy around Kelt 9, because again, we're boring and how we name things. And this particular star is super hot and bright. And they looked, not expecting to see a planet, they saw a planet and the outside of the planet is super heated by the star so that the outside of this planet is like the temperature of the sun yeah yeah like it it rains metal it's, That's so it's a metal. bad place to be yeah. but it's awesome that a planet was able to form well thank you pamela uh very interesting i can't wait for us to dig into these but thousands at a time now we'll have to definitely compress yeah. the show and we'll see you next week 
<laughs> bye bye. Do you have some names for us this week? I do. So as always, we are brought to you by our wonderful patrons at patreon.com slash astronomy cast. While our show may be going out on television, we don't have commercial sponsors yet. We don't know when I when we will. And uh, so we rely on you to allow us to pay Allie to play to pay Rich to get Beth putting show notes up to get Nancy wrangling everything. She's our project manager. And you guys make this possible. And this week, I would like to thank Robert Wenger, Joshua Adams, Catherine McCabe, Jordan Young, Burry Gowan, Burka Roland, Janet Wink, Aurora Leiper, Joe Hook, David, ACUT patron, Andrew Palestra, Brian Cagle, David Trogue, Robert Wenger, Venkatesh Chari, the giant nothing. Ben Lieberman, William Baker, uh, Laura Kettleson, Robert Plasma, William, Joe Holstein, Joss Cunningham, Les Howard, Paul Jarman, and Coco Sarif. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you all next week. Stop and save. Yes. The stopping. The stopping matters. You're like, well, what do I do now? My brain just turned off. Yeah. It just turned off. I, I literally was thinking, Coco Sarif is a really cool username. And I just sort of zenned out right there. Yeah. I might be hungry. I wonder what I'll have for lunch. <laughs> I don't know if your brain ever does that. Where it's oh, just yeah. like suddenly. Totally. And I'm out. I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> the, the brain is left. Yeah. <laughs> Mine left. Everything's now stopped and saved. Uh, all right, I'm going to give Richard a mono. I'm going to give Richard mono. I'm going to give Richard a mono version of the uh, of the audio. Excellent. Okay. And I'm going to upload. All right, if you've got questions for Pamela, uh, or Fraser, chance, or me, sure. He has no favorite planet. I have no favorite planet. No, I, I actually. Okay, all right. I, this may turn into a soapbox, but all we'll, right, we'll I'm see. gonna sit back. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah relax. just buckle up. Um, I don't like what's your favorite questions. I don't like them. So people ask you like, okay. what's your favorite TV show? What's your favorite book? What's your favorite blah blah blah? What's your favorite blah blah blah? Superlatives. I don't like them. I don't have them. I don't like them. So, see, so do just... I have a favorite? No, I can't. Like, like I like, I love them all. I love planets, and I. And there's some are really cool and others are less cool. But I, you know, what I'm, what planet I'm super excited about right now changes from time to time. Television shows, books, music, all that kind of stuff. And See, it's... I'm with you on all of those. But there's just like certain times when I do have a favorite, like extremophiles. I, I have a soft spot for tard tardigrades because Well, let me tell kill. you about the Pompey worm. And that you can do that. See, see, you may have a favorite of the moment, at least. Yeah, I don't. But the Pompey worm is a very impressive worm. But my point being, uh, yeah, I don't. It's, it's funny. Like I get those, I get those questions. You know, I get those questions on. Uh, <laughs> Beth Johnson asks, "What's your favorite question on this podcast been?" <laughs> <laughs> well played. Um, how's my Gordon Dewis asks, how's my Starlink working out? Uh, fine. It, uh, it's intermittent because I have trees all around me and houses and walls and stuff, but I, so if, so I'm not having to depend on it yet. So I'm mostly just testing it out. So what I do is I will, I'll take the Starlink out and put it like almost in the middle of the street. It's just like, <laughs> I'll just take the thing out, plunk it down sort of like right by the corner of the house where it's as far away from all of the the block, you know, blocking trees and stuff as possible. And it works great. They've, okay. Starlink is going to be the most valuable thing that SpaceX has ever done. It's going to be worth more than Tesla. Because it's already kind of astonishing, like 150 megabits down, 50 megabits up. 18 yeah. millisecond ping that's times. That's better than I have. Yeah. For a lot of people, that's better than what they have. 
and they're downplaying it. But when you, but the, the, the next generation that's going to be launching, they're going to be connecting them with lasers so that they can, they can communicate to polar locations. So yeah, they've already started launching. They've already this. started launching these ones. Well, well, eventually the, the current version, they're all going to deorbit and then you're going to have the, the, the one, they'll, they'll all have lasers. And what the lasers let them do is let these starlings communicate directly with each other. And so right now, when you send a message, you're going through fiber optic cables, which is two thirds the speed of light speed. I forget the exact amount. Once you go up to space and travel through the vacuum, it's actually faster to transmit anywhere on planet earth through space. So when in fact, the fastest way to communicate is going to be through the Starlink network. And it is a $10 trillion industry, global communication systems. And part of the reason it doesn't have the lag that you see in like satellite news broadcasts where you can literally watch the speed of light as they send a signal up to the satellite in geosynchronous, yeah. send it back down to the person somewhere else. Um, because these satellites are so much closer to the earth, the light travel time is less. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So it's so yeah. that's the difference. And in fact, in theory, they could even bring these things down closer. Uh, yeah, I mean, Simon is saying about astronomers, especially amateur ones, you know, like Starlink, amateur ones are less concerned than the professional. It's the professional yeah. astronomers that are having the real problem with it. Not I mean, amateurs, we have techniques for pulling satellite trails out of our photographs. We've been doing this for a long time, but the professionals, they lose data. Like it's yeah. just, it's, it's awful. You can both love something and hate it for different ethical reasons. Yeah. yeah. It's an imperfect system. Yeah. It's ruining the night sky for astronomy and it's allowing uh, remote communities to connect to the, to the internet, to the world. Yeah. So, you know, which one? What's it's, more important? Yeah, reducing the di digital divide mm -hmm. is is going to do a lot to help raise up societies that don't have access to things as simple as Etsy right now. Yep. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, it's crazy. I mean, just like remote education, remote health care. Uh, again, I mean, we talked about this before, you know, here in Canada, yeah. we have all these remote communities. It's a it's 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 already going to it's already making a big deal and it's just going to be huge and i think i think again <laughs> you know the telecommunications industry doesn't know what's coming for it because the fact that i have the dish here and it does its job yeah that is that we are already now the hard part has been done which is making this you know building the rocket company to launch the satellites to provide the internet etc all right um, someone asked me what I thought about the expanse expanse was so good. I, oh. I still need to watch this. Oh, season. This is the best season by far. It was so really? great. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was so good. Heart Cause here they've like really diverged from the books. Yes, they have. And if you look into it, you'll understand why. I shall do that. Yeah. Yeah, if you try to figure out, I don't, I'm not going to provide any spoilers, but they, but they definitely, but uh, it was so good. Yeah, it was, and it's, yeah, I'm doubling down. You know, fine. When people ask me what's my favorite TV show, my favorite science fiction TV show, I will, I will currently, I'm currently into the Expanse. Now, did you hear that they uh, remastered Babylon Five and put it out on HBO Max? No. I've been wondering yeah, so, when no one seems to have it. Yeah. So they just last week, they released a remastered 720p. Mm -hmm. So they like reran the CGI and everything. Yeah. And so that that is on my list of things that yeah. is going to happen when I can just stare. Yeah. Uh, Ludwig Lima Nunes says Starlink doesn't help most communities. It's, ex it's as expensive AF. Uh, it's the same price as my internet. So, so I'm paying the same amount for Starlink as I'm paying for my current internet connection. And, and, and what they're looking at is putting a box in a library in a yeah. rural community. Yeah. And then, and so, then running cable out from that library to other houses. Like you can, like right now, if you live in some small town in Canada, the price of internet is a million dollars. 
Like if yeah, you want to you... get it installed, you have to pay a million dollars to have it. Like, like, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Like if, like here, if you live even just like and they a don't have cell phone town, towers. Yeah, like my parents, they have three megabits down, one and a half megabits up, and have had that for ten years, and and they ask for faster service, and the tel telecommunication company just laughs at them. Yeah. Yeah, just says, you know, too bad. Oh, sorry, you live in a small town. Move to a big city. Yeah. So, no, no, this is, uh, there are plenty of, like, the point is, that, like, this just gets 150 megabits into a town that never had it. So, yeah. So, no, if you live in a city like I do, then it's not the way to go. But for, for all these little towns, li literally half the population of Earth, they're just you can not get... worth connecting to. Yeah, is you can get concern. internet to, to towns that are so small that K through 12 is all in one building that has no internet and now it can. Yeah, yeah, a school. A school can pay $150 a month, $130 a month, $100 mm -hmm. a month, I think, in the US and have internet, high-speed internet to the whole school. Yeah. When before they couldn't, they had no internet or just t like dial up speeds. It's crazy. So no, no, it's, you know, again, if it, if it came in at $10,000 a month, then I would be outraged, but it's, it's a hundred dollars a month for Americans. That's not outrageous. And, and so for rural communities that are disadvantaged, this gives you the chance to go hook up to the internet at the library. Yeah. do the things that you need to get done and go home. And that's an opportunity you didn't have before. And there's so many people out there that do amazing work that I buy on Etsy. I try to buy direct whenever I can. And to just imagine all the things that I've seen while out road tripping that are in places with no internet. Well, now those people will be able to reach even bigger audiences with the things that they're creating. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's take some more questions. Roger Haskins asks, what would our solar system look like to others? Uh, it depends on where they are. Um, so you would see Jupiter's mass dominating. Um, you would probably be able to see transits from Venus, maybe Mercury. It's so tiny that I put it in the maybe category. Um, but we'd generally be hard to see because we have a fairly large star, fairly small inner planets. So we'd be one of those systems that we don't quite have the ability to detect right. yet, but we will soon. Right. So let's say that they have an extremely large telescope and they've got, and the planet is lined up so that it was yeah. able to be detected with the radial velocity method. Although that would be maybe the transit method. It was detected with the transit method. So what would they see? So... <sighs> Right now, you're looking at being able to see pretty much Venus causing a slight dip. And I haven't figured out how Saturn's rings factor in, but I'm pretty sure that Saturn is sufficiently far out that, that you're still looking at not being able to make them out using the transit method. I don't know about direct imaging. I'm sorry to have so many I don't knows. Uh, Arjun asks, is there any area of the sky that we cannot detect planets for any reason? Um, the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so we do find on the, <laughs> the, uh, the Hobby Everly Telescope is in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so, so there's areas in the sky that don't have planets between us and a big old honking molecular cloud that's blocking everything behind it. So it's more a matter of there are obscured areas of the sky versus technological reasons we can't observe. 
Yeah, it's just, just the tells the the observing sites are so much better in the southern sky, and the telescopes well, are better, yeah. and so we've just got much better coverage of the from the southern hemisphere. That that is true as well. Yeah. You know, uh, Ludwig Lima Nunes says, what's the perspective for possible biosignature gases on the spectrum of exoplanets in the coming years? So we talked about just observing them, but we didn't really talk about analyzing them. What, how do you feel about that? So one of the things that I learned from the wasn't actually phosphine detection was even if you find something that folks believe is a biosignature, everyone's going to go, it's not aliens. So I, I have hit the point of being skeptical that if we find biosignatures that anyone will believe they're real. Yes, I 1,000% one, I 1, agree with you. I think that, that we're all so excited about James Webb launching and the extremely large telescope and their capability of analyzing atmospheres of other worlds, even Louvoir, name your giant telescope, the overwhelmingly large telescope on the moon. All of those won't see exoplanets with the level of detail and sophistication that we can observe Venus. And, and it looked like there was phosphine on Venus. And it turns out there probably wasn't. There was probably sulfur, sulfur. oxide. Yeah, sulfur, sulfur oxide. So so, I mean, what that means is that that it's going to be inconclusive with a capital I yeah. for a long time. Like, yeah. in, like until, like, unless they see something like chlorofluorocarbon, something really obvious or a message from another I, world. I, I'm kind of certain that it's going to take like a, a, direct message that we only see when a planet is lined up in one way and we can see the planet already via transiting or something else. <sighs> now, one of the things that, that some of the folks who do METI, which is messaging extraterrestrial intelligence here on Earth, one of the things that they talk about is figuring out the stripe on the sky where potentially the Earth could be seen by sufficiently advanced technologies using a transiting method. So it's a very narrow band along mm -hmm. the sky and sending signals out to detected worlds within that band. And if a society out there that knows we're within that band for them, that we can see them transiting, gets the same clever idea. And we happen to be looking when they're sending us a signal. Yeah. That might be the only way we definitively get something. Yeah, like you've got a signal that's coming from a spectrum of the radio frequency that is impossible. I've talked to a, a, bunch, <clears throat> a bunch of SETI astronomers about this, and they're like, there are bands that there's no natural way that they can send yeah. a signal. So if you get that, that is evidence. Apart from that, it's just going to be like, we think we see life. Did you? Right? Are you sure? Come on. I mean, we're experiencing this with Mars. Yeah. And Percy's going fossil hunting, and people don't talk about it that way. <clears throat> right. So that's the same thing. If, if Perseverance saw a fossil, like just yeah. a great big old fish. Giant stromatolite. Even a giant stromatolite. Well, that'd be tough. That one people would argue. Yeah. If it saw a giant fish. Big fish. We'll big fish skeleton fish. on the side of, of, of a Martian riverbank, then, then it would be done. But until then, it's yeah. going to be inconclusive in arguments. Like it, if it sees a squishy bodied something like the earliest fossils from Earth, that's going to get argued. Yeah. 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 We... Like, if you think that we're going to know if there's life in the universe, you're so wrong. Like, you're just so wrong. We are not going to know in our lifetimes. Even if it's, even if we're staring at the data, certain that it's there, we're still going to be arguing about it. Yeah, no, this is, man, I feel like I'm just ruining extraterrestrial Christmas here. <laughs> All right. Um... Ben Kalo asks, are all photons the same? Is an X-ray photon the same as a radio photon? Just carrying different they amounts have of different energy. energies. 
And That's the it. particles, they have different energies. So how they move, they have different wavelengths. They carry a different amount of energy. They oscillate at a different frequency. And all these things change together. So the characteristics that two photons have are the same sets of characteristics. Energy, wavelength, frequency. One photon to another, you may see this one's an infrared, that one is an ultraviolet, and how those things change, they change in lockstep. So every photon of the exact same shade of red has the exact same energy, the exact same wavelength, the exact same frequency. So two photons of the same color are identical. And you also have to look at how they're rotating, the polarization. You can get two that are identical on all the characteristics, but there's a whole bunch of different characteristics to track down. Right. But essentially, you can turn a, a radio photon into a x-ray photon and vice versa just by by stretching the space that it's in by That's squeezing true. the space that it's in that that the the photons began for the from the cosmic microwave background as as red and now they're microwave yeah and they're just they're the same photon so it's all the same thing it's just the amount of energy packed into it which is crazy <laughs> that heat and light the colors are the that you make a thing that that it appears to be giving off a different color if it's moving towards you than if it's moving away from you. It's kind of awesome. It is right. And it's because and I sort of think about it it's just like how fast are those wave those waves hitting your eyeballs as they're as the photons are coming towards you. And as the waves are crashing into your retinas, you're perceiving a different color. The velocity of light, not the velocity, sorry, the speed of light is always the same. The velocity can change because things have different directions. Right. The speed of light is always the same in a given medium, but all those other things can get changed by what the medium is doing. It's so weird. Yeah. Yeah, it was it, it, it was this moment of revelation when I learned, I think it was in physics at university or something like that, when it really hit home that that radio waves and x-rays are the same thing, literally the same thing, just they're all photons. And it's, you know, when we think through the entire electromagnetic spectrum, that it's all just it, the it same thing. All comes down to the energy you pack into something. If, if I threw a BB at you as hard as I could, you would laugh at me. If I went and I got the Christmas story air gun and shot it at you, First of all, my grandma would yell at me, even though she's dead. But uh, that would hurt because they have a different amount of energy in the two different BBs. Right. Very cool. Um, except they're going at different velocities, which light doesn't do. Anyway, uh, that's where the analogy falls apart. Cool. Well, we've reached the end of our hour. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching us today. Uh, Pamela, what's happening in your world that people should keep track of? Uh, so we're going to be doing a special episode of uh, Daily Space on Monday, and we're going to be discussing um, updates to our understanding of Betelgeuse, because Betelgeuse just refuses to behave. Um, there's new work coming out showing it might not be dust after all. It might just be a, a way that the atmosphere momentarily aligns such that we're looking at colder layers of the star. Um, so that's some cool new work that's come out. Um, beyond that, um, we're just plugging along. What about with you? What else? Going uh, we're going to try to do the star party again on Saturday. We've had bad weather, so that's made things difficult. Um, and then next week we've got the weekly space hangout. We've got, uh, Joseph Malozzi, uh, I think for, of Stargate fame. Um, yeah. Stargate fame. Yeah. He also did. A really weird new series that came out, I think, on Netflix that was science fiction and included Snoop Dogg as one of the people involved in the project. Cool. Yeah, so that's worth finding. I just can't remember. I what think it might have just come out. I saw an advert or something. So Bill Nash asked a quick question uh, yeah. about 
why don't they, why are they launching, essentially, why are they want, launching James Webb in a, um, in a tele, you know, in, in a folded up, very expensive, very complicated, very difficult thing. Why don't they just build them in, in space? And NASA is absolutely considering constructing space telescopes that it could be that the next generation, like Louvoir, et cetera, they're, they're actually They've been built. building this for so long. We didn't have rockets that could launch something. Right. It, it, it's. <laughs> yeah. So the this was supposed to go up in 2010, people. I will be. I, I'm gonna. I I did an episode on my channel about this. It's about yeah. space, um, like space based construction of space telescopes. Yeah. And I'll I'll try to bring the the head researcher from NASA to, to talk about it because we are at an inflection point. James Webb is the last time that you will ever launch a telescope in one go. They're going to be yeah. built. They're going to be assembled in space pretty much from here on out. So I, I suspect there will be a bunch of microsats doing specific pur purposes, like right. most the, right. the humble space telescope that, that, that was a microsat. No, no, um, no. But like, like, like the next generation, the 17, yeah. you know, the, the 15 meter telescope, the 25 meter telescope, something big in space. Yeah. You can, you can launch to these build that in parts and then you assemble yeah. them in space. Just like think about the international, imagine if the international space station was a space telescope. You do that. So so we know, so, you know, NASA knows how to do this. IKEA needs to start developing space telescopes, I'm telling you. There you go. That would be awesome. All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching us this week. Thanks, Pamela, for bringing the brain. Thank you to all of our fans, friends, moderators. Special thanks to Nancy Graziano, of course, for keeping us all organized. Um, and we will see all of you next week. Thanks, Bye -bye, everyone. everyone. Okay. Uh...